Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. I'm really glad your face isn't cherry red from all the sun exposure these last few days, CJ. I was I had all these jokes written down, all these nicknames written down about how red you were going to be, but you actually put sunscreen on your face. I'm very proud of you. Congratulations. Lo- I would say I have applied sunscreen three or four times every day during this trip because it's been a lot of maybe not sitting like, ex- like I'm not a sunbather, but you know I've been in the sun a lot. Yes. It's been 30 plus degrees every day and sunny, lots of pool time few activities this and that but um i'm i'm pretty pleased today's the last day of my trip which is not a good thing oh i will be sad to be coming home tomorrow but that i've gotten this deep into the trip that i've been in the sun as much as i have and i am not red so it, that's a, it's a small achievement thank god uh yeah but cj obviously enjoying a post-trade deadline uh out in vacation uh, we're gonna keep it short and sweet today folks as best as we can can i, can I let you in on a secret of course you can I haven't watched a hockey game since the trade deadline. That's, that's <laughs> it's going to be hard to do a hockey podcast when one of the two guys on the podcast hasn't watched the game in five days. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. That's why I was trying to keep it short and sweet because, like, I feel like it would have been useless to be like, "Hey, did you watch uh, Nashville Winnipeg yesterday?" <laughs> no, but to be fair, I have been watching the highlights. Obviously, yeah. you know. I, I am, I'm chilling out, but I'm not totally unplugging. This isn't like a, you know, July 28th, I am totally unplugged, for example, if it's an end of summer trip or in the middle of summer trip. But, you know, I do have to come back and work this weekend and next week and all that. So it's just, just a little quick, quick snack trip. So what's the, uh, the phone screen time like on vacation? I didn't check, but it is very minimal. Um, you know, I, I, I hit over 12 hours the day before trade deadline. Um, because Julia Tesheri from Bar Down was, she wanted us to send it. I don't know if she ended up posting them because I think the other insiders didn't want to do it. I think she wanted to do like some sort of Bar Down montage of the insider screen time. Um, but that's, so I know I got 12 hours the day before, I guess that would be last Thursday. Um, and probably didn't get two hours yesterday. I mean, I did, I watched it. I actually poolside, I watched one episode of the, do you watch Full Swing? It's the PJ Tour behind the scenes documentary. I have not seen that yet. Is that Netflix or well, the, or is it I? It's Netflix, yeah. And season two just came out in the last couple of days. So I watched one of those poolside yesterday. So that would have been about, you know, 45 minutes of screen time, but I was not I haven't been texting. You've probably noticed I've been quiet in the CJ show chat. Save for I've left the hotel room with the Save for when you post photos of with like, the, drinking beer or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just want to make everyone, you know. Just, just want everyone to know what I'm up to. <laughs> Every time people, not to hijack this and turn into something completely different, we will get to topics like hockey in Atlanta, uh, the Bobby McMahon suspension. Uh, there were a few other questions uh, that were sent in earlier in the week. Bobby McMahon signing. Yeah, signing, not extension. Matt Rempe suspension. Yeah, the Matt Rempe suspension too. Uh, I said, I said extension. No, but you said Bobby McMahon sus- suspension. I said extension. I said suspension. No. Oh. The beauty of the beautiful thing with this is it's recorded. <laughs> I can prove that you said suspension. <laughs> Bobby McMahon signing slash extension. Matt Rempe suspension. My voice just broke there. All I was just trying to say is I was trying to establish topics, but I just wanted to make I just wanted to ask and, and make this point all the time. I, I always like making this point because whenever we talk about these shows like Full Swig or Drive to Survive, I always get to thinking, what would it take? for some streaming service or some camera crew to follow NHL players around. And I get it. They don't have the personality to do it, but it would just be so much fun if we had an NHL equivalent to a full swing or a, a, a drive to survive or like some of the docs that follow the soccer teams on Amazon prime. I would just love that, but I know we're nowhere near that. The league, the league has done them, right? I mean, I think, one of the things, as I understand it, is, that's, I think, held those back from becoming more popular is there's just there's so many levels of sign-off. By the time that we see that the product that, that hits the screen, like it's been watered down and diluted and the best, most compelling stuff's been taken out. You know, I've only watched the one episode of season two of Full Swing, but I'll say it's pretty damn compelling because the golfers are not afraid. To, I mean, they're all independent contractors, right? Mm-hmm. They're not afraid to kind of take some swipes at each other. 
And it's a really interesting time in that sport, just with, you know, the, the rival league, the live golf coming up. And so a lot of it is centered around the decisions that individual players made, whether they went to live or stayed back. Some of the, it highlights some of the tensions between them when they, you know, play a tournament like the masters and both leagues are, are, are represented in those kind of events. So it it is pretty like, there's some edgy stuff in there. Like it's, it's interesting. And, and, the golfers seem all in on it. Obviously, the drivers, I mean, I think the drive to survive has been very, very successful with, you know, creating personalities and bringing out the personalities of, of the people in that sport. So, yeah, I don't I don't know if hockey could ever get there. But if we got a completely unvarnished, uncensored behind the scenes look at, you know, something like, you know, Matt Rempe and the game with the Devils. And, you know, we saw obviously Curtis McDermott's comments in in, in the media afterwards. But I, I just think like everything around that would have been really really interesting for example if they did that i mean imagine if they were behind the scenes on trade deadline day in front offices i mean there's there's all sorts of stuff that i think you know individual teams do a little bit of it the league does a little bit of it but there's there's room for more i think uh, built into that i love the matt rempe idea not just because we are going to talk about him on the show and maybe this could work as a good segue but this kid kind of comes out of nowhere and he establishes himself as a star of some sort through fighting and it starts this entire debate and dialogue about how much we really like fighting in this sport and if it still has that place in hockey and yeah i i think that that's actually a really interesting idea i'm not maybe if the nhl's listened to this maybe if bill daly's listened to this and they want ideas or i don't know who would run that uh but <laughs> uh no matt rempe uh we can get into it if we want to but uh recently uh, being assessed a four-game suspension for that high hit he laid out on Jonas Siegenthaler of the New Jersey Devils. That was that was a tough hit to watch, and just I would love to know your thoughts on it. If you were able to, see, you you probably were able to see the hit. Yeah, and I watched the suspension video that Player Safety put out. I mean, you know, obviously, completely dirty, indefensible hit. You know, I think what's interesting about the the whole Rempy phenomenon, if we'll, we'll call it that, is mm -hmm. you know why doesn't this happen more often? Like, you know, it just, it just seems like the right place at the right time for this guy. I mean, in terms of a player kind of taking the league by storm, I mean, the fact that he's what, six foot eight is notable. Uh, you know, he's obviously understands uh, his role as a fourth liner on the Rangers is to kind of stir it up a little bit to, to be an energy player to not going to get a lot of shifts in these games. But, um, you know, I just, I, I can't believe the degree to which, you know, he's become a talking point quite honestly. I mean, we're talking about him here. I'm doing my, my radio hits in Toronto. They're asking about him. Like, and it's not because he did anything in a game against the Leafs. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's the rare player who, who who's getting discussed in other markets in this league at times. And, and Remke's managed to do it. Um, you know, I do think that this will be a wake up call for him. I mean, a four game suspension is pretty significant. It, uh, it, it also puts him on the radar of, of the department of player safety. Right. I mean, it's, you know, once, once, you know, the, if he, if he crosses the line again, especially in a similar fashion, the next suspension is more than four games, right? I mean, this establishes a baseline of punishment for him and it's, it's a pretty high one. So, um, you know, I think the challenge for him is going to be navigating his way through the league, not crossing the line, but still being effective. Like I, you know, it's, it's narrow lines for someone like a player like that. And, you know, he's, he's as aware as anyone He's probably sitting home for this, this week when he can't play games. And understands if, if he's not being talked about for some of these reasons, if he's not throwing big hits, he's probably not in the league, quite honestly. Um, I, I don't know much about his hockey playing ability yet. We haven't really seen him play much of the games. Um, but but my guess is his his future is as a third or fourth liner in the NHL. And so, you know, I, I think he's he's still a pretty young kid and learning as he as he goes on the job and you know, that's a that's a big punishment. I but I think it was completely deserved in that case. And unfortunately, Siegenthaler um, seems like he has a significant injury. I know he hasn't played uh, since since taking that hit. What do you think of older NHL veterans like Curtis McDermott going out of their way to try to fight Matt Rampy? Here's the thing: there still is some degree of a code. Yes. Whether the, I mean, we might sit here and say it's stupid, we don't like it, but I don't think that either of us can deny that it's still something that exists in the league, and especially for players of a certain that are kind of. I mean, the heavyweights of today aren't like the heavyweights of the 80s or 90s, but, you know, there's certain players that, that are kind of designated as, as players that will fight, of which Rempe is clearly one. I mean, that, that, was, that was our first talking point on him a week ago is, 
can he keep fighting his way through every tough guy in the league? And then in this case, you know, he, he denies the the if the first ask from McDermott in that game, and then doesn't fight him after throwing that hit too. And right, keep in mind there was there was history there because he he laid a big hit in the previous game against Nathan Bashit of the Devils, and so I, I do think that there's sort of is it, it's archaic, it's a little barbaric. Let's face it. But there is still some level of that code in, in, in the NHL among certain players. And it's it's a pretty small subsection of players, obviously, that adhere to that or that are expected to live up to it. But I would say Matt Rempe is one of them. And so, you know, I, I think McDermott, I didn't think, I didn't have any issue with anything he said because I do believe that to be how it, it goes. And, and he's a more veteran guy in the league. And, you know, he didn't like what happened there. But, you know, I do also think all this being said, like, you know, new 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 lane of conversation. I do think we're going to see a, a a time in our lifetime where there's not fighting in the NHL anymore, and it's not, you know, considered part of the game. I mean, it's it's without question significantly less a part of the game today than it was ten years ago, or twenty years ago, or thirty years ago. And I just think it's going to continue down that path to where maybe we're not having these kind of discussions either. Is that for the better or for the worse of this game? I I want to say that it's for the better, but there is something about when those fights go down that I don't know, like we all get attracted to it. It, it, A lot of us will end up saying, Oh, this is like a reminiscent of the old days, or you don't see fights like this anymore. Or just the other day, there was a, there was a Chicago Anaheim game where there was an entire line brawl and John Gibson is coming from one end of the ice to the other. And everyone's all like, Oh my God, like let the goalies fight. Like as much as, as much as, (laughs) as much as some of us want to say that, fighting is archaic and barbaric and we don't want to see in the game there's just something about seeing grown men fight each other that still attracts hardcores to the game for whatever reason and the casuals and the people who don't care a lot about hockey they still recognize the sport as well that's the sport where people are just going to beat each other up as as fun as the sport can be with all the talent and the skill that's there it's still the sport at least seen by outsiders where people beat each other up legally. <laughs> I would say for me, one of the absolute best parts about hockey is the emotion. That too. It's, it's such an emotional game. And, and I don't know where that emotion gets channeled in a world if there isn't fighting or if there isn't, if, if like body checking is, is reduced or, you know, part of, I think part of what makes it so compelling is it's fast and it's aggressive. And I mean, it's so much fun, man. I, like, I just think about hockey. I can, like, I can, like, bring myself immediately back to a place when I was young and, like, when I first fell in love with the sport and played it and obviously never played it anywhere near a level that uh, are the people we talk about on this podcast twice a week. But, you know, I had, like, some of the best mom- moments and memories of my life happened just playing hockey as a kid. Like, I just, I loved it. And it's something that gets in your blood, this sport. And I do think, I don't know what becomes of it. And so I, I'm in the exact same position as you, where I have logical CJ who understands things like CTE and, and, you know, you want to protect the participants in the game as much as you can. But then there's also me who's at a game in the playoffs and you see a fight and you're like, Whoa, like, like, like I can be a barbarian too, unfortunately. <laughs> like it I have, happens. I have these two poles of me and they're, and they're, and they're at odds with each other. Right. Because I like, because I want to be logical and, and, you know, but I, I'm not going to lie. Like, I love the physicality. Like, I am already so excited for the first round of playoffs, man. And, Me too. you know, we're what? Like, five weeks away, but it's not that far away. Like, it's it's actually so close. Like, the weather's turning. Like, I just love the emotion that you get in the playoffs, especially. And so, where this leaves this conversation, we're just spinning in circles because I don't have a good I – don't, I don't have, like, a very clear – sight line here and i realize i should probably be smarter and be like well logically we shouldn't you know we don't we want to protect the players as much as we can but there is there is the emotional part of me that just loves that that those aspects of hockey too and and i don't think you're alone in that I, i i know that for a fact because i feel the same way too and i don't think we were spinning our wheels at all i think any conversation we can have about fighting uh it's always going to be a a point of discussion and maybe contention with some people and it's a conversation that Maybe you're right, and not maybe you are right. In a few years, it's going to be more and more of a conversation as we see more and more players coming from leagues where they've banned fighting outright, and its future in the sport is 
in more and more question. Remember, there are still players in the league right now who still see the value of fighting. And we'll, I, I'm very curious if we get to a point where the NHL says we don't want this anymore, how they would stand up or if they'd still be around for that day. But yeah, this is this is not a useless conversation by any stretch of the imagination. This is this is obviously worth the one. Lot. The one thing that's changed is it like in the in my early days, even covering the sport. So I'm saying it's not that long ago, relatively speaking. Some teams would have two or three players that almost exclusively what they do is physically intimidate others and fight. And stage fighting was definitely way more of a thing than it is today. Um, you know, where it's just like two two big guys line up against each other off a of face off and just fight because that's what they're there to do. Um, I think now the fights you see are more born out of, you know, from a hit or, you know, from sometimes the game spilling over in that way. Um, and, and there's just very few players that can only fight. I mean, basically all the guys in the league nowadays can, can play. And, and so it's in some ways, I do think it's, if you want to call it a problem, I think it's an issue that's taken care of itself in some ways. Like, I don't think the league has had to come out and mandate anything because, as the game is, you know, you have fourth lines now that, that are expected to produce some offense. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's it's a disadvantage if a team is dressing a line that, that is never going to score a goal and is only there to physically punish and intimidate opponents. So I, I don't know if we'll ever see it outright banned. I, we should get the numbers on this, but I'm certain the fighting majors are way down. Like, I just feel like anecdotally, you know, I, I have, even though I haven't watched a game in five days, I've watched a lot of games this year, and, and I just feel like you do not see that many fights still happening in the sport. I think if you go on, like, hockeyfights.com, I think you just have to just look at the numbers there and kind of go off of that. They track everything on that website in terms of any type of fight. Do you even know who the fighting leader is in terms of majors this year? If you were to ask me off top of the, of my head, uh, I would not be able to tell you without guessing. It's probably not Ryan Reeves. Not that he wouldn't fight, but no, I don't. I think he's only fought a couple times, Ryan. I would. Who? I mean, he's a big guy. There's not. There's not someone. There's not a fair opponent for him on every team. I would. I wouldn't be surprised if Matt Rempe vaulted himself to the top with the amount of times he has fought. I. It's a good question. Actually. I don't know where I don't know where to see the leaderboard on the site. I haven't been to this site in years, if I'm being honest. Really? Is you're actually looking this up right now? Yeah, and I'm trying to. I, I was hoping it would be a little more seamless, <laughs> like that there'd be a leaderboard. Okay, I think I think I found it. According to Hockey Fights, uh, NHL fighting majors leaders for the 2023-2024 season. Uh, if I don't know if you found it yet, but uh, the guy who's at the top, I have not. The guy who's at the top is a guy who has fought Matt Rempe this year. Olivier from Columbus? Uh, no, not him. Uh, a French guy, but not him. Delorier? Nick Delorier. Ten total fights. Uh, six away, four at go. home. He is the fighting major's leader. Where do you find that? Do you go to players in the drop-down menu? Or? I just... What did I Google? I Googled fighting... I actually Googled fighting majors, and it was the first thing that showed up. It's it's Delorier, okay. Andreas England, Liam O'Brien is on that oh, list. I see. Sam Carrick is on that list. Sam Carrick, uh, New Oiler, uh, Jonah Gadjevich is there too. Uh, Ross Johnston, no relation, I'm sure, uh, is also on the list. There's a whole bunch of guys on the list, but uh, yeah, it, I didn't expect to find that so fast, but uh, we did that. But uh, I like the conversation we had on fighting, <laughs> and uh, where it was able. We went down to, a rabbit hole. It was there. a really good rabbit hole for us to go down to. Uh, now I want to get to uh, Bobby McMahon and the signing of Bobby McMahon. Not suspension, signing. Uh, two years with an AAV at 1.35 mil. A good story out of Toronto. He's been producing, obviously, and he gets himself uh, a little bit more security with his new contract. What did you think of the signing? Well, I mean, it's a great story for a 27-year-old, essentially NHL rookie. I mean, he's, he, this is his first full NHL season, um, even though he did play a handful of games with the Marlies at the start of the year in the AHL, and he's older than Austin Matthews. So that, that's perspective in terms of the, the kind of, you know, fight that he's had to, to establish himself and to, to carve out a pro career. You know, he spent five years at Colgate, was in the ECHL as recently as two seasons ago, you know, was never drafted in the league. and and you know, to get a two-year one-way deal, two point seven million guaranteed over those two years. I mean, that's 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 huge, you know, security for someone who's who's traveled that path. And you know, I think what's interesting about McMahon is he's really shown an ability 
for a down the roster player to put up goals. And, and, you know, the reason I think it's interesting is because he did the same in the AHL. And, and I think that there was maybe question like, okay, do, do those skills translate, you know, to the next level up. And, and, you know, despite playing about 10 minutes a game for the Leafs, he's still got 10 goals in 40 games, you know, obviously not, uh, not, not playing with the stars, not getting power play time in there and, and, but still managing to be pretty productive. And, you know, I think he's a pretty valuable member of the team in that regard. I mean, you know, he, he could have been an unrestricted free agent too. That's what's interesting is that he, you know, chose to stick with the, the Leafs organization rather than potentially, you know, testing the open market this summer. Um, and I think sometimes that's about fit, right? He knows that the people within the organization believe in him. Uh, you know, they've helped get him professionally to where he, you know, now is a regular member of the team. And, um, and I know he's Steve, Steve Dangle's favorite player these days, I think. So uh, you got a whole video uh, on the STPN channel. I love that. I was like, what is the threshold of news that Steve will make at least video for? <laughs> Maybe not like, like if, if they like make a waiver claim or something, is that going to get a video from Steve or I, I think so. I think it's at that, depending on who the waiver claim is. Like, I don't see him being like, oh, let me, right. let's add this uh, video on the director of player personnel changes or something. I don't know. But like a waiver claim, if the guy's useful enough. Yeah, I totally see that. He's a feed. Right. And, and you know, the other thing about McMahon, actually, is he went through waivers at the start of the year. So, you know, this this was uh, this was a long time coming, I guess, and certainly was not a guarantee that he would ever get that that kind of contract. So, you know, everything is. Everything is relative in, in the sport. I mean, he's he's still on the lower end of the pay scale. Frankly, it's still a deal that could mostly be buried in the AHL in the future if for some reason things don't go well. So there really isn't a lot of risk that I, I would say or that I see on the Leafs part of, of this this deal. Um, but a nice signing for them and, and you know, a player that's, you know, a team maybe that needed a few good stories. He's been a good story, if you know what I mean. He's, he's you know, we, we know about the Leafs' core players, but they're, you know, forever looking – to, to round out the team around the edges. And I think in Bobby McMahon, at least they've, you know, it's, it's a homegrown one and that he's, you know, he signed with the organization and was in Newfoundland, played a couple seasons for the Marlies and now is a contributing member of the big club. All right. You mentioned Steve. Did you wish him happy birthday this week? I did. What number was it for him? 36. He's 36 because he posted that video of that one meme with that one guy uh, yelling, I'm 36. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I saw those memes, but I was like, does this mean he is 36 or he's not? Like, I didn't know. I was, again, I'm half, half falling along from vacation here. So I had to like, you know, turn over in my lounger and be like, what is all this stuff? I mean, in all fairness, even if you were back in Toronto, I'm, I, I still think you'd be a bit behind <laughs> on memes. <laughs> <laughs> Not, you know what I mean? Do you like share memes with people? Like, do you send people like reels and like funny, like what, what's your humor with the internet? Like, I, I I would say no is just the basic <laughs> answer. I mean, maybe the odd maybe the odd thing here or there, but you know, I'm trying not to live online, man. I'm trying not to be in the I phone think, too I mean, much. So like, I don't. Yeah, I mean, we we could all use a little less screen time. Whatever our individual screen time is, it could all probably be a little bit less. More time out here in the real world, my man. Yes, that's true. That's true. Uh, it's a lot better outside. Uh, more sun too. Anyway, uh, next story. Uh, Atlanta. Could there be hockey in Atlanta for a third time? Uh, Anson Carter, former NHLer Anson Carter, you may see him on uh, NHL on TNT. He is leading a group of investors uh, to have hockey in Atlanta again, uh, sending out a, a statement to uh, ask the NHL to commence the expansion process, uh, similar to what uh, was done with uh, Salt Lake City with Ryan Smith and uh, his group over there. Uh, the NHL put out a statement. This is written to The Athletic. The league appreciates Anson's passion for bringing NHL hockey back to the Atlanta area, and he has certainly kept the subject on our radar screen for several years running. While, as we have made clear, we have no expansion-oriented process in place currently, it's always good to know there is bona fide interest. I mean, even if the NHL might not actively be looking to do so, is Atlanta still high up on a priority list where does it rank compared to a houston or or a utah or or even a quebec city you know it's tough to, to say i mean i think certainly quebec city is at the bottom of those those places if only just due to population and and consumer base and and you know 
look, I'm a proud Canadian and, and I'm not, it doesn't bring me joy to say that, but you know, we're not that far removed from talking about the challenges the Winnipeg Jets are having and playing out of a small market right now. And, and I think some of the same market conditions that are challenged for the Jets would be a challenge in Quebec. Now, you know, I, at the risk of being an old man yelling at a cloud, I'm not sure how I there. feel about this whole idea of, ex, of expansion, man. Like, you don't know when enough is enough. Like, there's no magic in 32 teams. Like, I, you know, I can't say that's the perfect number, but I, I just don't. Like, how many teams do we need? Like, am I crazy? I I don't um, see the issue with having more teams. At the end of the day, I think the way fans react to their own teams, it's regional enough as it is. I don't get why people would be up in arms about 34 or 36 teams. It's not like well, people go out there and I'm watch every arms, single game anyway. I, anyway. I'm worried about diluting the product. And, you know... I'm worried that if you have 34 or 38 or 40 teams, like just by the math, most of those teams are going to go like 50 years before they can win a cup. Like, I just, I don't know. I think it's at a certain point, it just feels like too much to me. Um, but again, I realize that I don't have a compelling argument because I, I can't say 32 is perfect number. It, it just, I like the divisional alignment. I feel like the league's in a good place. And there's a weird, this is a weird dance, right? Like in, in all the prior years, like, I, you know, I've been covering the league. It was at the Board of Governors meeting when they announced, the, you know, the Vegas, um, you know, timeline, what it had to go on there. In those cases, it was like in the past, the league would start expansion process and, and people would apply. Now it's like people are applying for a job that isn't posted. You know what I mean? Like the, the, the league. And I, and I realize that, that some of this is semantics, but I just I don't see. I, I, I don't know. Look, at the end of the day. If, if they can get a billion dollars or a billion two as an expansion fee, and that gets, you know, that gets shared between all the existing owners, doesn't actually go to the players in a direct way. It's, it's, it's considered money that's outside of the league's, you know, revenue that, that is shared between owners and players. It's probably going to be too much money at a certain number. I don't know what that number exactly is to say no to, especially if you like the markets and the places they're going. And so I don't know. I just struggle with this topic. And, and you know, Atlanta, I, I covered the Thrashers a little bit. Like, I was in Atlanta the, the last go-round. Obviously, the NHL was there in the 70s. That team became the Calgary Flames as well. Like, I just feel like, is it really going to be all that different a third time? Um, you know, bless Anson. Awesome guy. Like, I'm not trying to hate on his his plans. But, you know, they're building an arena. Like, did you Google where Alfred Alfredaville is? Like it's far from Atlanta. It's uh, it's like is it? It's like a suburban area. It wouldn't necessarily be in the in the metro area. I don't remember how they've sequenced. And typically, those are the teams that struggle, right? Like in Ottawa, what's the talk been for years? We need a downtown arena exactly. because they play literally in the middle of the suburb of Kanata. Like it's now. To be fair, Kanata's growing up around that stadium, and it is you know a big, pretty big place nowadays compared to when, when the Senators first moved there and it was just basically a stadium in the middle of a farm field. But, you know, just generally speaking, you know, suburban arenas, I don't know. I think you need, you need the right arena in the right place. You need the right ownership group for success. And well, we'll see where it goes. But I'm, I'm, as you can tell, I'm not that enthusiastic about the prospect of Atlanta 3.0 in the NHL. From the athletic, the development would sit... Uh, for a proposed arena in the city. The development would sit on the 84-acre North Point Mall property in Atlanta's Fulton County and a 15-minute bus ride from the final stop of the MARTA rail system. That specific site and the city of Alpharetta, more generally, has long been viewed as an ideal home for any future NHL arena due to a core of hockey fans that coalesced in the area during the Thrasher's time in Atlanta. I mean, reading this, does, doesn't that make sense? I mean, if fine, you might be away from the area, from the main Atlanta area, but if you're around where all the fans are, and if, if it connects to public transit too. We'll defer to whoever wrote that article at our, at our whichever of our colleagues said that. I just, I don't feel like, it feels like a forced issue. It's like, it's, it's a solution in search of a problem. Like, I just don't see a need for more NHL teams, if I'm just being honest. Like, I, I really don't... Um, you know, look at if if the Coyote situation doesn't get resolved, one of these cities is going to get a team because they're going to have to move somewhere eventually. And I know relocation is painful, but I just 
I don't know, man. I can't get my head around it. I'm cool with it. I'm cool with the idea of more teams, not necessarily like 40 or 40. You want an 80 team league? You're not going to get to 80 teams. I think the people. Are you excited? You're like, it's not going to be you want 80 Cincinnati teams. in there. Yeah, and... I'm, I'm cool with like an Atlanta. I'm cool with a Houston. I'm cool with a Cincinnati. I'm cool with a Utah. Whatever. Fine. More revenue, more opportunities for people to work. And I get the people worrying about the product being diluted, but more opportunities for people. I don't think it's ever going to get to a point. Why is there no talk of Coburg getting an expansion team? That's what I want. I'm pretty sure Hamilton would have to get one first. (laughs) Coburg Cougars, baby. Yeah, of course. But like. (laughs) They're having a hell of a season. They're up 2-1 in their playoff series right now. Live uh, show in Coburg when? Uh, uh, We're adding you, Coburg Cougars. Uh, Invite us out to your town. Maybe we'll do a show. No, I mean, I. I I think they would love to do something with us, man. I think they would. It's. it's, We got to shake Adam's tree and get Adam Wild on this because this is. He's 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 the one who gets shit done around here. I mean, Jesse Blake does some stuff too. It's really, I mean, Steve. I know. I'm just. I know. Steve, he's got a kid. He's got another kid. So we'll we'll get let that slide. Who? He has, he has two kids. Yes, he has a. He's, that's a, he's a girl dad. Yeah, now. he's a girl dad now. You could be a. I mean, yeah, you could be a girl dad and a boy dad. You could just just be a dad. Good on you, Steve. What a time for that man. <laughs> anyway, uh, we can agree to disagree on expansion. <laughs> Honestly, like if if you're going to Atlanta, you got to be considering Coburg. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> that's the sentence that that's the <laughs> sentence that no one in human history has ever said. <laughs> if you're going to Atlanta, you have to consider Coburg. I'm sure. If we're gonna have 42 teams in this league, we should have at least one of them in. Oh Coburg. my god! Yeah, <laughs> that's such a, still laughing at that sentence. I'm sure. I'm sure I can move home and cover them full time. Oh my god! Anyway. Uh, I want to get to this other speaking. I'm glad that we're in this ridiculous mood now because we could get to this ridiculous story that has popped up on a Thursday morning. <laughs> the Pittsburgh Penguins have announced uh, that the shipment carrying Yarmir Yager bobbleheads uh, for a game on Thursday night against the San Jose Sharks has been stolen. Stolen. Oh, like with 17,000, I believe was the number. Tons of these bobbleheads stolen they're not in pittsburgh they won't be distributed at the penguin sharks game they'll be distributed at a later date i believe fans are supposed to be getting these one-time scan barcodes for when they're able to get those bobbleheads but this is such a weird story i I mean we don't know I, i haven't looked too much deeply into this but this is just ridiculous it's 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 such a weird story i mean how many boxes would would that be for 17,000 bobbleheads? I would imagine one bobblehead in each box, unless you're thinking of like the massive boxes with like how many you could fit in there. Whoops. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm just saying, like, I'm trying to, like, I'm actually trying to physically imagine how somebody stole that much stuff and why. I mean, what value do they really have? I mean, the Yarmir Yager bobblehead has to have some value. I guess. I feel like that's a lot of wasted effort. How would that happen? Like what's the what's the like 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 those heist movies, right? Like who who like is it like Fast and the Furious style? You're right. you're racing against this truck on the road and you're a lot like you're 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 getting three or four people in to steal this truck. Like who did this? You'll you'll note that in those heist movies are stealing like diamonds and rare jewels and things, like things that have tremendous value and make the heist worth it whereas if you steal seventeen thousand yarmir yager bobbleheads like <laughs> what are they worth at best are they worth like five dollars each i mean five dollars i mean they might be worth five dollars but depending on where you end up going with them you could flip them for like 50 and how are you going to sell seventeen thousand of them and not and not have someone figure out like I just there's there's more questions than answers with this story. I'll tell you that. There's a lot of questions, and uh, I love that they put out a tweet on it too. Though. I love that they did that too. Because you know, some people were probably going to that game expressly because they wanted the bobblehead, so they had to let those fa- fans down easy earlier in the day, you know, before they got there. There are children crying today. Uh, I don't know where I got seventeen thousand from. I, I think I had seen a tweet that said that number. I don't think it's specifically that, uh, but I, I'm sure that you go ahead. Do you have any bobbleheads? Like, do you collect any? Um, I do have a bobblehead, actually. I can show it if you want. Um, sure. Is it of you? 
I wish it was of me. It's not of me. Um, <laughs> I went to a Los Angeles Dodgers game a couple years ago, and I got a Tommy Lasorda bobblehead. I still have it in the packaging. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Yeah, I like And that made the move? I like bobbleheads. Okay. Because I don't, I don't own, own one bobblehead. You've never gotten, like, a bobblehead at, like, a sporting event or... I would have just given it away. Aww. I don't collect. I don't collect like that sort of stuff. I I I like doing that. I like collecting that stuff. Yeah, you're you're a hoarder. Yeah, a little bit. Like I've got pucks. Uh, I, I one thing I I don't like about my setup compared to my Montreal setup. I don't have a lot of the stuff I collect like in the background. But like I have mini sticks. I've got some pucks. I even bought like a a. An NHL All Star puck when we were in Toronto. Uh, I bought a Rangers puck recently. Actually, I'll, I'll wow. show in the memorabilia here. Uh, but yeah, like this was. And you're showing off that sick Drake shirt. Yes, in the middle. Yes, yes, yes. I really <laughs> wanted this hoodie. The uh, the NHL OVO collab. Uh, I saw the photo of Mario Lemieux wearing it, and I was like, yeah, I want it. But I I, I got this bad boy here. Uh, this is really nice. And then I bought okay. this at a Rangers game a couple weeks ago. I don't know. I I I. Look, man, I don't get to travel a lot for games. And if there's an opportunity for me to come back with something, like I, I, I want it. Like I want the, I want the memory. I want the memorabilia. I want the. There you I go. That. I love that. Stuff. Look, at, I'm not criticizing it, but I'm just not a like the bobblehead would have no. I love your beer Yager. Like I think I've probably discussed him a lot on this pod. Yes. I, I like I, I'm fascinated by the guy. And I've had some funny interactions with them and been lucky to talk to them over the years a number of times. But I just, I would not, if I was covering that game and they gave us that, I would just give it to somebody, a kid or something. There was a, like, I wouldn't. Oh, no, you go ahead. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. So I don't value it very much personally. So I'm looking at this and going like, why would someone steal thousands of these things? Like, what are you, like, who, where are you selling these? What's the point? I don't it know. Could be gritty. Where does your life have to go wrong to where you're, you're stealing Yarmir Yarmir boggleheads? Like, what happened to, to get that person or those people to that place? Man, we live in a weird time, man. People try to make this money. <laughs> people try to people try to take advantage <laughs> of it of a struggling economy. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, yeah, I shouldn't make fun of that. I know people are struggling there. I'm actually not trying to highlight that, but like, again, if you're going to commit a crime, I just do not understand this crime. <laughs> if you're going to commit a crime, not this one. <laughs> <laughs> don't do this one. Don't commit crimes with checks. Just don't do this crime, says Chris Johnston. I appreciate that. I hope we find out more, though. I, I, I hope so that too. they are apprehended and that the, and these bobbleheads get to their rightful owners and that there's a happy ending to this story. I also wonder, too, like, if this was, like, at all, like a, like a publicity stunt or something. And then I just read the the statement from uh, the uh, Penguins president of business operations. Uh, we were shocked to be a victim of cargo theft and are we are working closely with local and federal authorities on this investigation. This is very serious. Yeah. Yeah, they're not they're not goofing around. It's not April 1st. You don't have to check your calendar, oh, you know. Oh man. Anyway, sorry. To... That actually is like that's that's an April Fool's type of it joke. Would be. Though. Like like that seemed like it, you know what I mean? Like it <laughs> it's so ridiculous, it's hard to believe it's true. I, I feel bad for laughing, but like this just bobblehead stolen. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I, I hope that Pittsburgh Fe Penguins fans get their bobbleheads. Justice for Penguins fans and your ever younger. This episode of the Chris Johnston Show is brought to you by Babbel. What if in 2024 you got a little bit better every day when you're learning a new language with Babbel? That's exactly what you're doing, and if Babbel can help you start speaking a new language in just three weeks imagine what you can do in a full year be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works you don't have to pay hundreds of dollars for tutors or waste hours on apps they don't really help you speak the language Babbel has a quick 10 minute sets of lessons and they're handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks and Babbel is designed by real people for real conversations. Their tips and tools are approachable, accessible, and rooted in real-life situations and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. I know I've tried learning uh, German and Spanish, and Babbel's been extremely helpful with that. Babbel has over 16 million subscriptions sold, plus all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day 
money back guarantee here for a limited time for our listeners right now get 55 percent off of your Babbel subscription but only for our listeners at babble.com slash johnston that's 55 percent off at babble.com slash johnston b-a-b-b-e-l dot com slash johnston rules and restrictions may apply um we can get to uh, a few questions, not that many, uh, but uh, we did put out yeah, hit, hit a couple. Yeah, we put out a call for questions earlier this week, and uh, there were so many, and uh, we, there were a few we didn't get to. So we're, we'll try to get to a few before the end of the show today. Uh, Producer Drew, who asked a question last week about Lindy Ruff, and well, <laughs> I know and we <laughs> recorded it, and it was immediately, it was immediately <laughs> out of date. Whoops. <laughs> Shout out, producer Drew. Uh, which LTIR players make it back for their team's respective game ones? I wonder where this conversation's going to go. Well, he probably hopes I say Gabriel Landeskog. Yeah, it doesn't seem like that's likely now. It does not. It doesn't sound like Mark Stone's going to be back for game one. That's the funny thing. Like, I understand the frustration people have to some degree about the LTIR stuff. But I don't think there's any, there's like no evidence here of any funny business by Vegas. I mean, unfortunately, you know, a player has a lacerated spleen. It's not even a normal injury that happens. I mean, I know it's happened to other hockey players, but it's not a typical injury. And it does carry a pretty, it's a pretty serious thing. And it carries a significant time off. So I don't think you're seeing him play game one um, for Vegas. Who else is is on that list of possibilities? Um, I'm, well, what is Thomas Hurdle Thomas Hurdle supposed to be coming back uh, before the regular season? Yeah, right? but they say he's back before the end of the regular yeah. season. Like they they don't need his LTIR space. Um, I don't know. I don't think this year this isn't full of sketchy ones. Like, well, we can fully say the Nikita Kucherov situation was an eyebrow raiser. Like the guy literally, you know, obviously it's a, he did have a significant hip surgery, but the timing. Comes he comes back for the first game against Florida. I think it was in the playoffs. I think he had like three points. Like he just like dominated the playoffs. Like that one was a little bit more. It felt like the rules were at least massaged around that one. But I don't. I don't feel like this year there's there's any case where a player is just going to, you know, hold out till game one and and the team's benefiting from. What do you it. think of people who say there needs to be a salary cap in the playoffs? I don't like that. It's it's too complicated, honestly. I think that, you know, I made this point on the last episode, but I'll underline it again. If, if we're really concerned about the machinations of this, we should be looking at changing the way the salary cap works entirely. And then there's then this issue, there's ways to eliminate this issue entirely. Um, but if, if we're going to have a hard salary cap, there needs to be some flexibility built within it. And this is a sport where players are routinely injured and are playing hurt and, it's, so there's going to be naturally some gray in that system all the time. And so I just, I don't think we need a cap in the playoffs. You know, I'm actually headed to GM's meetings next week in Florida. And I'll be interested to see if that conversation gets revived a bit because two years ago at the general manager's meetings, it did, you know, there was a sort of, I guess you want to call it a, a, a you know, a possible system that was put forward by Ken Holland where essentially it was, you can have any limit of, in terms of salary on your roster in the playoffs, but you could only dress a lineup that's cap compliant that night. So if the cap is 83 and a half million, you can only have 83 and a half million, you know, players dressing your lineup at any given time. Uh, and the league looked at it and moved right on because I just think, I think the way Bill Daly put it, it's that's a oversimplified solution to a very complex issue essentially. So I just, I don't see it happening. And I know for sure we would be on here bitching and screaming and yelling if a team had to play with like 15 skaters in a playoff game because of the cap. Ridiculous. And so, and so that just, that will never happen. There's no reason for it to happen because the, you know, the, the salary cap doesn't apply during that time and, and roster limits rosters are expanded to basically any number of players. And so I think, I think the system works just fine, you know, quite honestly, I mean, there, there might be the odd little exception here or there, but I, I don't think we need to, to reinvent the wheel here. Also, people need to remember, uh, because I see people using the word loophole, and I've made that mistake, and I've learned, it's not a loophole if everyone is allowed to use it. So, yeah. Just the rules. It's the rule, 
And I still think uh, if certain players were on that LTIR space, we wouldn't hear certain fans complain about it. It's really just because it's Vegas and they found ways to win within the small amount of time they've been in the league that everyone's mad about this. Oh, and Tampa too, because they win a lot. Basically, if you win a lot and you take advantage of that rule, nobody likes you. Yeah, remember Kucherov got like the, the shirts made up with, I can't remember what number it was, $92 million roster or whatever the heck it was. Remember he was like having fun with that though? Like, yeah, that's fun. That's fine. Like, I don't know. Maybe maybe we're going to come across as haters because that's, that's a pretty contentious topic with fans. But like, I like teams that win. I know I don't always cheer for teams that win, but I like teams who try to find a way to win. And I think that's cool. Anyway. Well, and look how many teams are using LTIR right now. Yes. Like it's just it's necessary. Like there's like I don't know the number, but it's 16 or 17 teams at various points this year have had to go over the salary cap because of injuries to their players. It's just part of the system, and it's not just one team doing it. There's lots of teams. Like I think the Leafs payroll is seriously like 95 million or something this year, but they've had a lot of injured players. They've had a lot of injuries. I mean, it's just just is what it is. Matt Murray's been out all year, for example. So, yeah. Anyway. From Sven Craig, not sure if this has been addressed before, but I'm curious. When a player is salary retained by my multiple teams, do they receive multiple weekly paychecks from different sources? How does that work for taxes if you're being paid by both a Canadian and an American team at the same time? Good question. Yes, you do get multiple paychecks because quite literally it's salary that's you know retained and that team keeps paying you. So Eric Carlson would be getting two paychecks, you know, for as just one example from San Jose and from Pittsburgh now. Um, you know, NHL players' uh, tax situations are very, very complex because in certain jurisdictions, I mean, first of all, there's all sorts of different issues, right? A, someone who plays in a Canadian market can actually be considered an American resident if they spend their off-season there, and obviously they spend a huge chunk of the season there. In certain tax jurisdictions, if you play one game, and, and I think Tennessee might have this rule, for example, you have to pay Tennessee state tax for earning money technically in that state. So basically, I don't know the answer on the tax question. I just know that the situation is extremely complex. And basically, each player's accountant or whoever they have looking after their, their taxes submits a list to the teams where they sign to say, like, on this, they spent this many days in this city, this many days in that city. And... It's all very complex, but I do know that one of the misnomers that's out there is that if you play in a Canadian market, you end up automatically paying more taxes. I think that there are some things that can be done in Canadian markets where actually the tax rate is much lower than places like California. So that's a long way of saying, <laughs> yes, if you get salary retained, you get two or three paychecks. And the ta the, like I have a hard enough time with my taxes and they're very straightforward. <laughs> I can't even imagine what it's like for these individuals that live and play and, and earn money all over the place in different jurisdictions. Here's one from Chris Jenkins. Where's somewhere you want to go on your next vacation? Somewhere exotic or just a beach? Well, I'm at a beach now, yes. so to speak. Though so I'm going to go more exotic. And I think I'm going to go back to Europe this summer. And a place I'd really like to go, and I've heard a lot of great things from people that have been and I haven't been, is Reykjavik in Iceland. So that's that's probably the next place that's on my radar that I'd like to go. Haven't made specific plans yet or anything, but you know, I think that I really like European vacations, obviously. And uh, you, can, you can see lots of different countries in a couple of weeks if you travel around. And I'd like to go to Iceland. I've, I've been pretty much everywhere else in Scandinavia. I mean, not... I haven't been to every town, in, but I visit all the Scandinavian countries except for Iceland. So I'm going to complete that bingo card at some point here in the next few months. I'd like to do a Europe trip. Uh, I've only been to England, but I would like to do a proper England, France, Italy, Germany, just kind of hit on a few countries Dude, in that continent. You can't go wrong, yeah. honestly. You can't go wrong. Yeah. I've got family. I've, I've, only, I've only been to Italy twice like i haven't been around italy as much as because it's such a popular destination for north americans that's probably a country that i'm overdue to see more of at some point but uh i don't know if that'll be this summer or somewhere down the road but love love italian food as remember you asked that question recently if you can only eat one type of cuisine i would be picking italian yeah. you know uh i know we're about to wrap up the show there's one topic that just came to my head that i realized we didn't bring up at all and i have no idea if you 
but I mean, you weren't really watching any of the games, so you might not have seen it, but maybe you watched the highlight. Connor Brown in the Edmonton, with the Edmonton Oilers. He finally scored a goal. I know, and they went nuts. He was actually going to be my stick tap was going to be Connor Brown. Well, let's get into it. So then. Give, give him he set me tap. up perfect there. Connor Brown, super guy, you know, been through a very difficult knee injury. Obviously, has not been the, the same player he was before that injury and his return to Edmonton. You know, goes 50 plus games without scoring, has one going off his skate, and the fans go nuts. Some of them throw hats on the ice. And, you know, just a super guy. I mean, I got a lot of time for Connor, really appreciated getting to know him earlier in his career and, and happy for him to get that goose egg off the board. And who knows? The playoffs are a weird thing. Like maybe he's not going to score a lot of goals this year, but maybe he's got a big one in his in his stick, you know, at some point in an overtime game or a close game that Edmonton needs to win. And uh you know, I mean, it does say something. I know he's a penalty killer, but he's he's managed to keep a place in the lineup despite that lack of production. Um, and uh, was happy to see him get get one on the board. Man, I couldn't get over seeing his face as all those fans got up on their feet and gave him that ovation. It's like this sense of relief just came to his face, and maybe in a little bit of disbelief at how all these people were cheering him after he scored a goal. And I get it. It was this this bank off of his his skated into the net off, a, off of a, an Evander Kane pass. But when you go that long without scoring, like, what a feeling for that man. So I'm happy that he got that celebration. Well, and he's reading the criticism. You know, people have talked about his contract. He had a massive uh, games played bonus earlier in the year. Obviously, has not performed at the level of which he's been paid this season. Like, all that would be built up on his shoulders. Like he, he hears it and feels it more than anyone. And so nice to see him have that moment. As I say, maybe there's more, another big moment or two awaiting his season. I mean, wouldn't that be some kind of poetic justice? And and that's, that's what we see in the playoffs. I remember last year, Alex Kerfoot had a tough season for the Leafs was pretty down on himself. And he scored one of the overtime goals in the series against Tampa. And, you know, Sheldon Keefe, you know, kind of gave a nice answer after that game, just talking about how he, he kept telling Alex to stay with her through the season that he, he was going to score a big one for them. And he did. And, and you know, that's, again, part of the magic of the playoffs. Hopefully uh, there's a bit more ahead for Connor. I think of Phil Deneau in the 2021 season who had a really tough year in terms of goals. And that was when he was a pending unrestricted free agent. And he ends up being the Canadians' most important center all postseason. Remember after that first round series, he's in the uh, the press conference room with the pizza. And now he's getting paid in L.A. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, it happens. Like, it, it can happen. Are you going to cross check me today, by the way? I saw some people wanted you to do that on, on Twitter. About what? Because I, I put out a tweet on March 12th saying, you know, four years ago today, things got weird. And I put out the, the, the copy of the league's press release when it paused the season. And I actually could not believe how many people commented on that. Like, don't remind me what an <laughs> awful thing to say. Julian, cross check CJ for this. I was like. It's just the thing that happened. Oh I was God. just marking a point in time. I did not see this. I, I literally, I just gave got. I got give this man a cross check. I got a lot of hate. That's so funny. <laughs> I was. I've been doing this whole pod in the back of my mind, wondering is Julian going to cross check me for no, that tweet? I, I, I remember quote tweeting it and saying that like, like I like looking back on certain things. I have no interest in looking back at that pandemic, twenty twenty. Everything else that happened like after that, I'm cool with. I mean peeling the curtain back here in the late parts of 2020 the uh the cj show was starting to come together like i look back yeah, at yeah. stuff like that that's great that's awesome B sitting at my crib like waiting to figure out what the hell's gonna happen with the world no <laughs> hell no <laughs> well honestly do you know what the origin of that was on my flight down here i watched there was a documentary on their canada flight but it's called something like Day Sports Stopped or something like that. Chris Paul actually was executive producer. Wow. And it was all behind the scenes of like, you know, that, that coronavirus, how the leagues, like what all the leagues did to like get back up and started. And it just hit me. I was like, oh, wow, this is like the anniversary. This is in like two days. And so I went through my email and I found, I just screen grabbed that NHL thing. And I don't know, I thought, I thought it was interesting that four years have passed. But anyway, I was not trying to like bring people back to these bad memories, but that like I got ratioed on that tweet. I thought like people would be like, "Oh, that's interesting," but I got scorched on that thing. 
Wow. <laughs> Look at all the so if you want to cross check me, I'll take it. Uh, I will take it. I will I will cross check uh the pandemic. Why not? Because that was not a great time. You're spared from this. You, you, I don't think you did anything wrong. It's it's fine. Um uh, <laughs> someone it wasn't like shout out it was amazing when we had like no fan playoffs like i wasn't saying like that i was just saying four years ago these sports leagues paused like remember how crazy that was do you remember like watching tv and the only thing you could watch was like bundesliga soccer yeah i didn't watch any bundesliga soccer so i don't even remember that Damn. i remember watching a lot of netflix like that Jordan series came out, which was pretty awesome. That was like the only thing holding us together for like two months. And Tiger King. Oh my god, <laughs> Tiger King was crazy. I wa- Carol Baskin. I watched the hell out of that. I watched that too. I'm not gonna lie. I remember, like, uh, I got into a lot of TV shows during that era. I remember working these late shifts with the Canadian press at the time, and wa- like there were there were times I got assigned to do these like 9 p.m., 5 a.m. shifts. And to pass the time, I would watch New Girl, which I hadn't seen at that point until then. Dude, I went to like 70 playoff games in the 2020 playoffs. God. Because they were like, I was going to like three games a day in Toronto at the start of that thing. And then I went to Edmonton for a month and just like going to playoff games every day with no fans. Like it was, it felt like it was like the weirdest experience of my life. And and obviously because the pandemic was going on, there was like nothing you could really do in Edmonton on, on the downtime. So I just like hung out with my buddy Arpin Basu, who was there covering it as well. Stephen Wino was there, Emily Kaplan. We all just kind of like hung out in each other's hotel rooms and like played music. <laughs> like it was there just wasn't a whole lot to do. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> That's how tell- I got on the run, the run stuff. I, I was like, I gotta do so with my time. So I started running every day. I'll I'll say this. I mean, as a, as crappy of a time the pandemic was, it did in a way lead to some cool things. I'm happy about that, but uh, yeah, yeah, of course, my cross check, my cross check goes to the pandemic, not to you. You're okay for posting what you did. You are spared from it, but uh, yeah, I don't. That's that's not very timely of you to be cross checking the pandemic four years later. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's the definition of a late hit right there. Oh yeah, my bad. This four years ago, we should have done that among other things that happened in 2020. Uh, I said we were going to keep this this episode short and sweet. Obviously, I failed to do that. Uh, Not the first time, obviously. You should have known that was coming when I said we're keeping it short and sweet. Uh, But uh, great episode. You know, right now, producer Nick is just like throwing his hands in the air. He's like, Julian. Yeah, he's he's, he's probably cussing me out right now. Sorry, Nick. Uh, We'll be back on Monday with a brand new episode. Um, You keep stroking your beard. Do we need a beard oil sponsorship? I'm a little dry. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah, we need we need a beard oil sponsorship. Anyway, get your questions in for the Monday episode and uh, subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to the podcast. Thanks for listening, guys. We'll be back next week. Peace. The Chris Johnson Show. Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter at ReporterChris. And follow Julian McKenzie at JK McKenzie.